Buckle up because we're going to talk about challenging some of those uh, maybe uh, myths about how you parent adult children and how to do it more successfully, which is our goal is to equip you to be the best parent you can be, whether they're 15 or 25 Mm -hmm. or maybe even 35. There you go. Gary, welcome back to Focus. Well, thank you. It's good to be back. <laughs> it's always good to have you. You brighten the room. It's, it's good. It's, seriously. <laughs> but let me say, so many parents contact us with that anxiety about adult children uh, because they're making the choices that we as parents hoped when they were little they would never make. When they were teens, we were on our knees praying, Lord, help them with their decision making. Anybody pray like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, help them with, with his friends, Lord, all those kinds of things. But you say parents should avoid blaming their child and to first consider uh, their own mistakes. So that uh, <laughs> pointing the mirror right back at us, right? Well, that's based on what Jesus said. Okay, you know, okay, let's you, add that weight. Why are you trying to get straighten them up? Behold, there's a plank in your own eye. And that doesn't mean that we're responsible for all of our adult children's decisions. No, 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 no. But it does mean that we ought to at least reflect upon our past and what we did or did not do that might be contributing to something that our adult children are now doing. And, and there is a place for us to apologize to them if we realize there are some things, places where we fail them. Do we, should we? I think it'd be a good exercise, but you know, so often we use that, that um, statement that you know, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. When we see these behaviors in our kids, we should really look first and say, okay, did they learn that from me, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, one of the most sobering questions I ever ask myself when our children were growing up, is what if my children turn out to be like me? Hmm. What if they turn out to drive like I drive, (laughs) to treat their spouse the way I treat my spouse, Mm -hmm. you know, and on down the line? And some of the significant changes I made along the way were when I answered that question for myself, you know. Yeah. The other aspect of it, and I think this is what's so hard for us as parents, uh, you know, you are nurturing these children when they're little, you're taking them to school, in elementary school, the carpool. These are all affectionate things in my memory, you know, dropping them off or having them jump in the car, very excited to see dad in the pickup line. And and then, then it's junior high and maybe you're not as excited to see them <laughs> in high school, et cetera. But um, you talk about the most common mistakes parents can make with adult children. And uh, for example, overprotection or micromanaging, that's probably cutting really close to a lot of listeners and viewers <laughs> right now. That 21, 23 year old, um, we can tend to continue to micromanage them and not let go. I guess the question is, A, why is that so hard? It seems right when you read it in a book, yeah. but it's hard to do. Yeah. Well, you know, I think by nature, as you said earlier, we want our children to have the best possible life as Christians. And we're going to make it happen for you. Yeah. And we're going to make it. Yeah. (laughs) And we're going to make it happen. And there's no question about it. When the children are little, we have to do that because they can't do anything by themselves. But we want to be thinking in terms of this child is going to have to be independent. At 18, chances are they're going to go to college, join the military or hopefully get a job or something, you know. And so here they are now, you know, 20 years old, and we're still jumping in to whatever situation they are and telling them what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And we build a wall between us. They, they resist that. They push away from that. And consequently, we're not having a positive influence on them when we do that. But we do need to have a positive influence. We can't change our adult children in their decisions. We can't control them. Right. And when we do, we lose the opportunity to influence them. So I think if parents realize, yes, I want to have a positive influence on my adult children, but I can't control them. We have to give them the same freedom God gives us to make our own decisions. And let's face it, God's first two children made a poor decision and we still suffer from it. Right. I mean, right. He was not, you know, he's perfect. But in that context, you know, his kids chose unwisely. Yeah. And uh, that wasn't under his control. It was their control. But it's so hard to process as a parent. I it's mean, true. It, it's, but he had to let them, he let them suffer the consequences. Correct. Took them out of the garden. And we have to allow our adult children 
to suffer the consequences. Yeah. You have an example of a couple, I'm sure you've changed their name, Steve and Linda in the yeah. book, who had a daughter who struggled. Describe what she, the daughter, was going through, and then what them as the parents yeah, had Yeah, well, what through. they did, when she went off to college, they took all, paid all of her bills in college, and they gave her a credit card to buy whatever she wanted to during the college years, okay? Mm-hmm. Well, she finished college, she gets a job, and she uh, has a roommate, and they are renting a, a place together, a, a, a friend of hers. And uh, one day, the parents get a call from her roommate saying, I know you all care deeply for your daughter, and I just think you need to be aware of this, that she's, for two months now, she hasn't paid her share of the rent. And she I loaned her some money, and she hasn't paid me back. Mm. And I just think you all need to be aware of that. So the parents thanked her, which they should have. Yeah. And then they had the conversation with their daughter, you know, and just kind of shared, you know, what they'd been told. And, uh, uh, and then also, not only did they hear that, but the gal would come home every two weeks and bring her laundry for her mother to do her laundry. Uh. And then she'd have dinner with them that night. And so uh, they shared with her, you know, what they had heard. And they, they said, you know, we began to realize that we really failed you in some ways. Uh, here you are at this age, and you don't even know how to do laundry. And you don't know how to cook. And you don't know how to manage money. Mm. And in, in the conversation, you know, she said, well, I just feel like y'all are very disappointed in me. And they said, no, we're disappointed in ourselves. Mm. Because we realize that we did not teach you these things. And these are things, just skills that everybody needs to have. Yeah. And so... If you're open, we'd like to try to make up for that now. We'd try to learn how to do that now. So rather than you're bringing your laundry here for us to do, it's okay if you want to bring it here if you don't have any machines where you're yeah, living. but you do it. But you do it, you know. <laughs> and then while you're here, we want to teach you some skills about cooking yeah, uh, because it, well, it's going to help you in your life. And, and then we want to talk to you about some money management things and, and money management yeah. skills. In fact, uh, we might even find a class that we could all take on money management together. You know, maybe at the local college or something. Yeah, that's know. good. You know, Gary, that reminds me. I can't remember his name specifically, uh, but that former Navy SEAL admiral who gave that commencement speech and talked about make your bed. Mm. You remember? Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, one of the things that we look at with people who can succeed is when they can do these, what most people would consider most mostly mundane tasks. But get up in the morning and make your bed. But the point being, these little routines that we can sometimes overlook, because we're looking at the big picture. Where's the character? Are we doing devotions together? Do they love the Lord? And those are the things we aim for. But sometimes we forget to teach the little things that take a young adult in the right direction, like make your bed, like do the laundry, those things. Do you find that in your counseling? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, here's here's an interesting story, the end of that story. The gal, young gal gets married eventually, and her husband feels like he's got a treasure. This girl can cook. <laughs> this, this girl can do laundry. He has this no idea. This girl can manage money. Yeah. And he says to her parents, I hope that if we ever have children, I can raise them to be like your daughter. Oh, wow. My. Wow. And they, they thanked him, and they got in the car, and they said, ooh. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I wonder what that conversation for the, the young couple was on the way home. Honey, there's something I got to tell you. That's so encouraging, though, because it's never too late. Never too right? late. Kind no, of absolutely. Really yeah. You know, Gary, the other side of this. So, you know, we're kind of stressing this idea that the parents have missed some things, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also, and I think I can tend to lean into this, you know. Okay, my kids are over 18. My job's done. Everything they do is on them. And I'm going to wash my hands. And, oh, that's too bad. Oh, that's too bad. So how, how do you not become so disengaged that you're not being a helpful parent in that 20, 30 something space where you should be? I mean, we yeah. kind of, you know, adults, we have this weird thing about living on a switch. We're either all on yeah. or we're all off. Yeah. And yeah. the Christian faith draws you into kind of a dimmer switch, Yeah. you know, and, yeah. and so speak to that parent that's done. I'm done, Gary. Yeah. I think basically we have to realize that we are going to have an influence on our adult children either positive or negative. And what we want to do is have a positive influence on our adult children. So I think rather than telling them what they ought to do, to say to them, look, anytime I can help you, I'm happy to help you. 
Anytime you want my advice, I'm happy to give it to you. But I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to control your life. Uh, because uh, you, you, at this age, you, you're able to, you're, you know, I want you to be independent. But I'm available if you ever want my advice on anything. Yeah, that's and chances so are they will ask your advice yeah. on things, and you can have a positive influence. I would think the healthier the relationship is, the more of that interaction you're going to get because the kids trust they can come to you with something that is a deficit in their life. Yeah, and a lot of that depends on what kind of relationship you had before yes. they became adults. You know, yeah. uh, there's another account I tell in, in the book of a, of a father who had two uh, adult young 20s, you know, uh, boys, you know, J- Josh and Brad. And he uh, he realized that when they did come home, they talked a lot with their mother, mm. but they seldom ever engaged him in conversation. Huh. And he began to wonder what the problem was. And he talked to his wife about it. He decided, you know, looking back on it, I didn't spend a whole lot of time with my kids when they were growing up, these, these two boys. Didn't develop Yeah, I was working, 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 you know, and... And so he, he just sat down with his boys and told them, you know, he said, I'm feeling uncomfortable because I'm realizing, you know, you all feel really comfortable with your mother and you talk with her freely, but you don't talk much with me. And I think it's my fault because I didn't spend a lot of time in conversations with you all growing up. And the boys are kind of uncomfortable with that conversation. Yeah. But, but he said, but, you know, I, if you guys are open I'd like to spend more time with you as adults, oh, wow. and I'd like to, you know, have more conversations with you. So mm-hmm. they started having breakfast every other Saturday morning. Yeah, and they started going to. Uh, he started going to sporting events with them, and they started having conversations. And before long, several months into it, they started asking him questions. Yeah, you know about dad. I'm thinking about buying a car. I like, I like your advice on this. Yeah, you know? that's good. So I mean, it shows what you were saying, John, a moment ago. It's never too late to rebuild those things yeah, and yeah. to it is a different phase having young adult children. I yeah. mean it is it's one of the great things, Trent, when we go to breakfast he'll often say, you know, I really love this phase of our life right now because yeah. it's like I know you're my dad, but I feel like you're a good friend. Yeah. And that's a that's a great statement. That's um, so Gary, uh, in this book you've got a story about Barbara and her son Tyson and um he kind of was flailing around and, and not getting anywhere after high school uh, graduation. What can you tell us about that scenario? Well, let's face it. There are a lot of parents who, who can identify with this. You know, the child is trying to decide, do I go to college? Do I go to you know, some other type school? Do I join the military? But then sometimes they're not doing anything. And sometimes they go to college and come back, and it's the same thing, you know. And, and so that's the situation with this couple. And so he's, you know, living at home. He's spending time with his friends every night and staying up late with them. He's sleeping late in the morning, but he's not motivated to get a job at all. And so it, it's, there comes a juncture at which the parent has to say, you know, honey, uh, I don't know exactly all that's going on in your life and all or what your plans are for the future. Uh, but I want you to be able to enjoy life and eventually, I, if you want to get married, to get married and have children and all that. So maybe we need to discuss some of these things together, you know. Communication is what happened in that family. When they started communicating with mm-hmm. that and finding out where he was and what was going on, then he could begin to take some steps, you know. And, and, and we can help them do that. But if we just accept it and don't have any communication with them, they could be there for 30 years. <laughs> I have found a lot of parents struggle with having that initial conversation That's because right. like, well, I didn't expect that a year after you moved in or you never left that you'd still be here. So it feels like I can't even really broach the subject. It kind of goes back to what Jim was saying earlier. Yeah. How do you get into that? Some of our biggest lessons we learn by our failures. Yeah. And so our children may have to learn some hard lessons by their failures as well. Yeah. So. If they make poor decisions, uh, we have to allow them to suffer the consequences of those poor decisions. Uh, you know, if a young, if for example, if your adult child gets stopped for driving under the influence, and he's in jail, and he calls you, or they call you and tell you that he's in jail, I wouldn't go down and bail him out tonight. Let mm. him spend the night in jail. Mm. Then go down tomorrow and talk to him and try to decide where we go from here. Right. You know, you bail him out, then. 
He didn't suffer the consequences. Right, he didn't feel that. God, she didn't feel that. Yeah, God lets us suffer the consequences. Yeah. You offer some specific guidelines about how parents and young adults should negotiate expectations and responsibilities yeah. at home. Uh, what does that guideline discussion look like? Yeah. Well, I think if the young adult comes home and he's moving back in, that is the time to have a conversation about, okay, we're, we're happy for you to be here. Let's talk about how we can make this work best for all of us. Yep. And so we're going to share, we'll share some of our concerns and thoughts. You share some of yours and let's make some decisions here on how we can make this beneficial for all of us because uh-huh. that's what we want, you know. And starting it early rather than waiting three months before you bring up a conversation like this in which you're really frustrated by what they're doing or not doing, far better to have that conversation early on. I like that. I mean, I like that. I'm just trying to think, how does that play through? Well, we we had a rental agreement that I drafted for Hmm. each of the kids when they bounced back, and I just changed the names every time somebody would move back in. And it stipulated this. Well, it was a regular lease agreement because they were going to have to have that or already had experienced it. So it's like, these are the expectations. This is when rent is due, and you, yeah. this is how you'll you'll operate in the family. Gary, I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned temperament a little while ago, yeah. and I, I want to kind of bring that around because in the book you talk about planners and strugglers yeah. as temperaments, I think, in part yeah. with our children. Describe the planner and the struggler. Yeah, well, you know, when, when adult children either come back home or they stay home, the planner is one who has ideas of where they want to go, They can't afford maybe to be out by themselves now in an apartment somewhere. So they're planning, if I can stay here for the year and I'm going to get a job and do this and save my money because I want to go to college or I want to do this or the other, whatever else, they have ideas on where they're going. And this is great because this is this is the easiest thing for the parent because yeah. they realize this child's going somewhere. One foot out the door at high school graduation, basically. Right. But the struggler is the one who comes back home after they've had a failure. Yeah. And they've lost their job or they've uh, dropped out of college or they're having problems with alcohol and drugs or whatever. They come back. They're struggling with life. But, and that's totally different, and it's a totally different yeah. situation. Well, in fact, you mentioned that, the distinction between loving and challenging. And that, to me, rang of art, the art of parenting, mm-hmm. that it's not a scientific methodology, a formulaic approach. You kind of have to know what to apply when. Yeah. That idea between love and challenging, man, that is tough, especially, and I'll lay this backdrop to it, with a rise in anxiety, depression, loneliness within 15 to 25 year olds. Yeah. Let's just say that in the CDC, the Center for Disease Control has talked about this and they, their survey work is it's gone off the charts. Yeah. The, the, the level of anxiety, particularly within that age group. Yeah. So speak to all of that as a parent, because this is all, especially if we're fairly well-informed parents, we know all of that is occurring and in the kind of in the wash of this effort to apply the art of parenting, helping our kids when they may have high anxiety or depression or they've been bullied or all the other things where it's outside normal. Yeah. And that's when our child desperately needs our love. I mean, that's the first step. We're not going to get anywhere if the child doesn't feel loved by us. And that's where the love languages actually can help them at that point. Yeah. Hoping they've already learned that love language concept and they know that adult child's language. If not, they ought to discover it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then communicating love to that child in a meaningful way to them so that what I call their love tank is full and they're coming back broken. And they know they're broken. They know they're struggling. You know, it's just that they, they don't know how to handle it on their own. And they need you desperately. And if they, if they feel your love, then they're far more open to your suggestions. For example, if, it's a, if, if we recognize that they're feeling depressed and all of that, to say, you know, honey, uh, this is something that's common with a lot of people your age, and, but there is help. And uh, let's, let's find out a counselor in our area that, that's a Christian that can really help us in this area. And we can go with you if we need to. You can go by yourself. We'll ask the advice of the counselor on that. 
but we want we want to we want to help you because we yeah. love you so much and and there's life beyond this you know yeah. so it's communicating that kind of love and that there's hope for them because they don't have some of them don't have a lot of hope at that juncture depending yeah. on what they've been through yeah yeah that is so good and everybody said amen <laughs> <laughs> But the, again, with young adults, uh, the knowledge between how we negotiate our expectations and responsibilities in the home, can you make a distinction between, you know, again, we don't feel like we need to negotiate as a parent of a late teen. Hey, this is my house. And I'm not saying that's how you do it, but yeah. we kind of all understand those rules, right? Yeah. But now it's negotiation time. And we, again, as parents may not have that art form of good negotiation skills, especially in the context of if they're coming back into the home, the responsibilities that you have, how we yeah. see it now for that parent that's in there right now <laughs> with their 23-year-old who doesn't know where to go and is yeah. coming home this yeah. weekend. Yeah. I think to say to that uh, 23-year-old, you know we love you. You know we want the best for you. And so while you're here, we want to make this a learning time and a growth time for mm-hmm. us and you, because it's different now. You're an adult now. We're still your parents. We care about you, but you're an adult. And so, but you're living with us. And so we want you to experience some of the things that you're going to experience in the real world mm-hmm. when you get out there. And uh, one of them is uh, having some, some things to do here at home. Because if you're living out there, somebody's going to have to clean the toilet and going to have to cook, and somebody's going to have to you just list all these things. And we want you to learn how to do some of those things. Yeah. Are there some of those that you would you would really like to learn yourself that we might ought to focus on? So you give, let them have a chance. On, but they're going to be doing something and right. they're getting the idea. And so then you negotiate what we're going to what we're going to do, what we're going to be trying to help you with in this particular time of your life. And I think the other thing is to say to them. If they have a job, they may or may not have a job if they move back. But if they have a job, just say, you know, if you had your own apartment out there, you'd be paying two thousand dollars a month for an apartment now. Now we're not going to charge you two thousand dollars, but we do want you to be paying something, yeah. so that you have the sense that there's a monthly rent that has to be paid. And if you are doing it with us, then you, you, we're getting you ready for doing it out there. Kind of life's you. normal rhythm. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. One of the things is. How much guilt we can carry as mm. parents uh, for the outcomes, yeah. and I, you know, we own so much of that. And part of it is you've got to let go of that, yeah. so that your relationship remains healthy, right? And I could I, let me add this to it and speak to this as well. Our our self-imposed expectations that you know, if we're good Christian people, if we're good followers of the Lord, that the product with our children should be there, and they too should be perfect children, perfect young adults. And that that is not the equation, everybody. Um, People have free will. The way your kids behave is not a reflection upon you. They have their own way to go. Adam and Eve did it. Are we going to say God is no good because Adam and Eve made bad decisions? I I don't think that's the equation at all. But we have to be sober-minded about that guilt that we can carry and how that then seeps into our relationship with our adult children. I think that's really true. As a matter of fact, one of the most common things I hear from parents in my office, particularly if their child has made a really poor decision that's against their moral beliefs, their Christian beliefs, and that sort of thing, they say, Dr. Chapman, what did we do wrong? Right. We've loved this child, we raised this child, we gave our lives to this child, and now they've done this, and they've made this decision. What did we do wrong? And and I try to say exactly what you've said. You know, we can't take the full responsibility for what our children do as adults. I said, and I remind them of what you said. I said, God's first two children made a poor decision, a bad (laughs) decision, you know? And it wasn't God's fault. God has given us freedom. They're free and you're free. I'm free Mm -hmm. to make our decisions. We can walk away from God. We can walk to God. And we can make poor decisions or wise decisions. So we're not responsible for the decisions that our adult children make. That's so true. In fact, in the book, you mentioned a situation. I think it's Max and Megan. And you talk about their daughter, Debbie. I'm sure all these names have been changed. So uh, folks, don't worry about (laughs) about that. But what was their situation? What was Debbie getting into that they couldn't control? Well, their daughter had made the decision to move in with her boyfriend and live with her boyfriend. Mm. And for any Christian parent... Gut-wrenching. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Because we know God's plan. You know, yeah. marriage is important. And so they really wrestled with this mm. as to what, what they're going to do, you know. And again, they began to realize we can't control her. We can't make her not do this. Right. So we have an option. Are we going to write her off and just say, if you're going to do this, then don't don't come here. Don't bring him here. You know, all these just lash out at her. Well, if you do that, you lose the opportunity to have a positive influence on her. Because you just radically came down and said, you do this, then we're having nothing else to do with you. I mean, that's the message that many parents give. You know, and you're not sure the outcome of that situation. So as the parent, you need to look at the long game. Yeah. Because it's highly likely that relationship will not uh, last. Yeah. And then you've got to be in a position to maintain that influence because you haven't burned those relational bridges. But this gets really dicey, Gary, in terms of standing for those principles that we believe in yeah. and making sure they know it yeah. in the right tone, yeah. a loving tone, and yet maintaining that linkage so that when that relationship falls apart, or better yet, they decide to get married. I mean, that's a rejoicing opportunity that they've come around to it. But in either perspective, talk about that, how the parent looking at the long game, which yeah. may be just a year or two in this case, yeah. or yeah. five years, but y y you've got to maintain a relationship. The other side of it, and speak to this, is, hey, you know our position. That does not line up with who we are and what we taught you. So as long as you're doing that, you're not welcome in our home. Yeah, I think, that, I think what that does, it erases the opportunity to have a positive influence. And in terms of the fact, if she marries him, he's going to be your son-in-law. And if you've taken that stance, you're probably not going to have a relationship with him after that either. Mm -hmm. I mean, this could be a long-term fractured relationship if we take that approach. But if we say, on the other hand, honey, I think you know how we feel about this. And you know we have strong feelings about it, that this is not a wise thing to do. And it's not just because we're Christians that we take that stand. It's because research indicates most of the people that do this don't get married. And if they do, their marriage is not better. It's worse. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we don't want you to do this. But you are an adult. And you, you, you can make your own decisions. And I want you to know, we love you no matter what you decide. Yeah. Just like God loves us even when we do wrong. And we love you. Uh, so, you, you, hear, you hear my heart? I do, I do. Let me push a little deeper, because I, I'm just mindful of the parents that are living in this space, because some of this, to me, this is the gift of the prophet, the gift of the evangelist, and, and what I mean by that is temperament. And this can get dicey in your marriage as the parents of the adult child, because one of you has this attitude of, hey, we've got to look to the future. Let's not burn the bridges right now. And the other spouse is like, are you kidding me? How can we tolerate that? Yeah. And it's it's both are defensible biblically, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But which is going to get you to the right outcome? And there can be a lot of stress in your marriage around that adult child's behavior because the two of you as mom and dad see it differently and keeping your marriage intact <laughs> number one <laughs> is a model that they need to have right. that parents can disagree on something but we talk our way through it and we make the decision that we can agree on and if you can't agree on it then don't make the decision yet you know, and pray in the meantime, God will give you wisdom. And honestly, that's a place where if that continues to be a block for the two of you, you do want to seek help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, John, we talk about that, but this is, I, I say this out of my own experience, Gene and I, this is where you not, you really could use some counseling yeah. and yeah. have a third person, a qualified person at your church or through Focus on the Family, through our counseling efforts here, we'll do that for you. Uh, to talk about this and get some perspective so that the lagging spouse might be able to catch up with the yeah. other one. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and both can see the benefit of the approach that you're taking. I think it's one of the most beneficial moments for, you know, relatively healthy couples to say, okay, we need a little help here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. A, a third Christian party <laughs> yeah. who can help you think through it and identify with your feelings. I mean, we can understand both of those positions, you know, but let's think about what it's going to be 
What's going to have the most positive influence yeah. on that? That's what you want. Another heartbreaking issue is when uh, young adults decide they are dealing with the LGBTQ spectrum, the gay and transgendered issues that are so prevalent, uh, particularly in public schools now, yeah. with the rise of that or the affirmation of that kind of declaration. Uh, explain why condemnation or despair is the wrong response, even though this is perhaps one of the most gut-wrenching situations you'll face as a parent. Yeah. I think there's no question about it. When a child reveals to their parents what they, how they perceive themselves and that they announce themselves to be this or that or the other thing, it is extremely painful for parents. Yeah. I've, I've seen them weeping in my office, weeping together, just totally brokenhearted to believe that their son could tell them what he's just told them, you know, that he's homosexual or whatever else he's, he's, he's telling them. Deeply, deeply painful. And that's why, uh, you know, as a counselor, I am deeply empathetic with those people. You know, you, your heart just goes out to them. You Talk wish, about the guilt questions as a parent. Oh, yeah. What did I do as a dad? What yeah. didn't I do yeah. and that would have helped him yeah. uh, not end up in this place? Yeah, and that's exactly what the couple, last one I saw, that's exactly what they said. Yeah. What did we do wrong? And, you know, let, let's face it, we don't understand all the dynamics of that whole sexual right. Science thing, doesn't you know, even understand. We don't, none of us understand that. But we do know that people do have the same-sex attraction. But that doesn't mean they have to live the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, God calls us to a celibacy. Whether we're, we have those feelings or we have heterosexual feelings, we're called a celibacy before right. marriage. And God also has his definition of marriage, too, and we all of that. And so that's why I think we're so disturbed is because we know that this is not going to be for the good of the child. Anytime we're not doing what God laid out for us, it's not going to be good for them. And we all have temptations in one area or another. Yeah. You know, if you're heterosexual, you have temptations, you know, toward adultery and toward, as Jesus said, looking at a woman and lusting after her. Right. So whatever our feelings are, we all are tempted but God wants to help us make the right decision and not follow the temptation. But as parents, I think, we have to ask, how can I be God's agent in trying to help them walk through this? And again, we have to come back and realize, I can't control them. I should not try to control them. God does not control his own children. We are free to make our decisions. Right. And so we have to ask ourselves, what am I going to do here? And there's a lot of questions that are going to come out of that. What do we do here? What do we do here? What do we do here? But I think once we express to that child, when they revealed it to us, and we express to them how, how yes, this hurts me deeply, and, and you, you know yourself this, this is against everything that we have taught and the Bible teaches and so forth, but I want you to know I love you. You're my son, and I'm never going to not love you. Or you're my daughter, and I'm going to always love you. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to try to work through my pain and my hurt because I am hurt. We need to be honest, you know, with yeah. with our children. You know, uh, let me add this, and you can get a perspective. I've met with people in the LGBTQ community and, and talked with them about their journey, many of them out of Christian homes. Yeah. And the one recurring story that just grips my heart is that moment that they're talking with their mom and dad at the kitchen table, yeah. revealing this. And often the comment is, my dad stood up hugged me with tears in his eyes and said, I love you, but I never want to see you again. Get out of my house. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, folks, that is a common statement that I hear. Yeah. Think of the damage done in yeah. that moment. And yeah. it's hard because when you're looking, Gary, at the lever of control, when your child says something like that to you, your desire to press that, that throttle yeah. to full control is yeah. there. Yeah. I, I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know what to do. And therefore, unconsciously even, I'm going to control this as best as I can. We're yeah. going to get you to therapy. We're going to, whatever it might be. Yeah. And there is a time for all of that. But the time in that moment of disclosure is to make sure that they know that you care about mm. them yeah. and they don't understand all the whys of this. Yeah. But we've got to fight for you yeah. and find out what's happening. But, yeah. but keep the linkage. Yeah. Keep the relationship. Because if you take that other stance, I don't want to see you again out of my house forever. I'm glad God doesn't do that to us. 
Yeah, no if kidding. If he did, we'd all be written off. Isn't that a great illustration of yeah. how to do it? Yeah. How does God treat us? Mm. And John, let me mention again that idea of the counseling department. Man, donors have supported us to the extent that we can employ counselors here at Focus that are available to you. I don't know of another Christian ministry that does that. I'm, they may be out there, but this is our commitment to you. We want to help you. We'll mm. talk to you. You can call and schedule an appointment with a fantastic Christian counseling team. They'll get back to you. They'll talk about these topics with you and I think provide you with some great insights on how to carry that healing forward, which mm-hmm. is our goal. We can't stay in that, but we will get you started in the right direction and take advantage of it. Don't be shy. I, we've been at this almost 50 years and It's something that Dr. Dobson did right at the beginning of Focus is to establish a counseling effort. Do it. Get a hold of us. Uh, It will not be embarrassing to you at all. You know, moving into the mending of the relationships with the last half of our time together here, one of the most difficult letters I've ever read was a, a woman who wrote me not long ago, and she was probably 32, 33, and she said, you know, when I was seven, my father took me out to lunch to say that he and my mom weren't getting along and that they were going to divorce, but it wasn't my fault, that that I had no responsibility in that, which I thought, oh, that's good. So far, this is good. Then he said, you know, I'll have you every other weekend. I'll get you two weeks during the summer, and I want to maintain our relationship even though I won't be living with you at the house. And she said that was the last time I heard from my dad. And she said, "I'm, I'm now 32. And all I have done since that day is to try to find affirmation from men. Wow. Terrible relationship after terrible relationship. Mm-hmm. And I think of that poor dad. And I say poor in what he lost. Yeah. He yeah. lost that relationship with his daughter. Yeah. For whatever was on the other side of the fence. Yeah. And to hurt her and to wound her like that. Yeah. To make that promise and to never keep it. Yeah. I the deficit in his soul should be large yeah, because of the devastation Mm -hmm. he created. So speak to that importance of the reconciliation of those relationships. How do you recommend young adults? She initiated that letter to me. Yeah. Someone she doesn't know. Yeah. Other than the radio program. Yeah. But how does a young adult initiate that heart-wrenching reconciliation with that parent that has left them behind? Well, if they have any contact with them, that is, they know how to contact with them, then writing a letter to that father, for example, mm. after all these years, and just saying, Dad, I just have to share with you my heart, da-da-da-da-da, and, and just share the heart with him. And I I wish I could have a relationship with you even after all these years, yeah. if that were possible. It could be the first step in there being a reconciliation. Yeah. And that doesn't erase all the pain and the problem of those years, but it may bring a certain level of healing Absolutely. to both her and that father. That father likely would respond with, okay, let's get together, and he would likely apologize to her. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, and that would be a great outcome in the beginning of that healing. But there's also that possibility yeah. that you won't hear back for whatever reason because of his deficits. Yeah. Um, speak to that person the benefit of still doing that even though you might not get the response that you need i think you have the benefit of knowing that you did what you could do your conscience is you clear. reached out that's right and yeah. you can release that father into god's hands knowing that you're putting him in good hands because god is both loving and just and if that father turns to god he'll be forgiven if he doesn't god will take care of that yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Gary, that's, that, that relates to just kind of a general application you've got in the book for parents and the kids, the adult kids, to um, write a letter and maybe not even send it. So yeah. what's the importance of that? I think there's, there is some value in that. Is, uh, if you're the uh, adult child, uh, pour, writing a letter, pouring out your heart to, to your, the parent that you feel that cuts you off or whatever, not with a view to, to sending it to them necessarily, but with a view of getting that all off of your heart and your mind, actually putting in writing. It, it's, it does something to you emotionally when you do that. You may later decide to send it, you may not decide to send it. But I think there is value in that. But when you do that, I suggest also, you, you begin to think, okay, what did my parents do right? 
What should I be thankful for? Well, number one might be they didn't abort me. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I'm it's here. simple. I'm here. And then from there, you begin to think, what are the things they did for me? Yeah. And chances are you'll find a li- pretty good list that will help you balance what you experienced in that one event. It, it, because many times it's a one-time event. Yeah. And, 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 and that there, there is a positive side to them. So you yeah. give thanks for those things. And with those, you might decide to send that letter hmm. of thanksgiving to them. Oh, that's a good one. If they respond, yeah. then you could say, is there a chance we could get together? And when you get together, then you can, you know, they, they, they likely will apologize to you. They know they've done wrong. <laughs> yeah. They know it. We're aware of that. But yeah. you're looking at the positive thing and tell them, thanking them for these things. I would not be here if it weren't for you. Uh, getting together can, can, can begin the process of healing that relationship. You know, Gary, listening in the last couple of days, the thing that is kind of bouncing around in my head is this idea of selfishness. What you're expressing so often is a form of selfishness as the parent. Yeah. Selfish about the future I didn't get with my child, the the child that didn't become the child I wanted to have. Yeah. The, it feels like there's a, a selfish root to some of this, that your expectations weren't met in the behavior that they're demonstrating. Yeah. And you got to let that go. That's in yeah. you. Yeah. And then, and then to move to that area of forgiveness yeah. um, is so critical spiritually. I mean, now neuroscience is showing, you know, we talk about uh, being afraid of science. Christians have nothing to fear from science because yeah. it is reinforcing the very things that we believe yeah. because we are correct in believing that he yeah. created us. Yeah. And when you see science in that, in that perspective, you know, now they can put an MRI to your brain and see the impact emotionally of your brain physiologically from fear and the things that scripture talks about the things that will harm you and the things that will help you speak to the power of forgiveness that does so much for you emotionally spiritually and physically yeah i think when we release that person who has hurt us most deeply we release them to god it's kind of a one-sided forgiveness. There's, they're not, they're not apologizing. No expectation. Yeah, they're not apologizing to us. It's just that we are not going to carry that burden and the emotions that go with it, the hurt, the anger, the bitterness, and all of that. We're going to release that person to God, knowing that God is a just God, and we can trust Him to deal with them. We are pour, releasing our anger, our bitterness to God, so that we are now free to live our lives without that bondage. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why the Bible says, you know, don't don't hold anger inside. It turns to bitterness, you know. Yeah. Gary, we are right at the end, and it's unfortunate. I, I've got a whole list of more questions, <laughs> but we've run out of time. Um, speak at the end here to the importance of a parent ending well in terms of their own personal integrity and values, which will communicate so much to either their estranged adult child or their a fully committed Christian adult child. Either way, it's a win. Yeah. But again, it's that long view, and ending well is so critical. So there's no regret. Yeah. There's nothing, no stone unturned yeah. that should have been discussed before that last breath. And I'm sure some of you listening and viewing, I mean, it's you're in that critical moment. You, you may not have time. What does that person do to say, I do not want to die, not finding resolution to this. Yeah. I think, first of all, sharing our real heart with God and asking God to help us to maintain to the very end of our lives our own walk with Him, our own commitment to Him. The one thing you can control. That's right. Yeah. And putting our children in God's hands. You know, we've done everything we know to do. If there's anything else we can do, Lord, please show me what it is. I want to do it. But, but when we've done everything we know to do and he doesn't bring anything else to mind, Lord, help me to be faithful so that it, when they hear about my life, if they're estranged and don't even know, they'll know that I was faithful to you to the yeah. end. You know, that's why I pray for myself every day. God, keep my heart. Keep my heart. I want to be faithful to you to the end. Wherever our children go, that's them and God. We're responsible for our own walk with God. That's well said. And it gives you a sense of peace. Yeah. You don't have to be writhing about what your Mm -hmm. kids are doing. 
and uh, you know you trust the Lord for the outcome. Gary, this has been so good. Your new book, Your New Life with Adult Children, A Practical Guide to What Helps, What Hurts, and What Heals, and a great perspective. I so appreciate you spending the time with us. You're going to be here at Focus for a couple of days, helping uh, in a variety of ways with content. So thank you for that contribution to the team here. Well, thank you. It's always good to be here. And let me make the suggestion, (laughs) the recommendation that Uh, Be part of the ministry. Make a gift of any amount. If you could do that monthly, that truly helps uh, even out the budget for the year. Or a one-time gift, if that's where you're at, that's acceptable and appreciated. Uh, And when you do that, we'll send you a copy of Gary's book, Your New Life with Adult Children. As our way of saying thank you for being in the ministry with us and also getting some great content to apply in your own household. Yeah, donate today when you call 800, the letter A in the word family, or you'll find the link to donate and request that book in the program description. On behalf of the entire team, thanks for joining us today for Focus on the Family with Jim Daly. I'm John Fuller inviting you back as we once again help you and your family thrive in Christ. 